Good afternoon, everyone. Thelma Greater Dallas is pleased to present this webinar, Elevator Safety, what you need to know to protect your tenants. And we welcome all of you to this program. My name is Christine Lang, your Boma Greater Dallas president, and I will be your moderator for today. Please note that today's call is being recorded and all participants will be muted. However, you can enter any questions that you have for us. Um, at any time during this presentation, there's a little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to address your questions as soon as we can. If you're listening to the audio only portion and you do not have access to the chat box, please submit your questions to cbransford at bomadallas.org and we'll address your questions after the broadcast. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our BOMA Greater Dallas Keystone Partners for their support. America's Corporate Building Maintenance, Blackman Mooring and BMS Cat, Britain Building Maintenance, Serta Pro Painters of Far North Texas, Citywide Building Services, Flynn Companies, Property Paving, Reef Parking, Texas Roof Management, and United Mechanical. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker speakers for today's panel. Carol Gray with AMST Elevator Interiors, Janet Freeland with Kone, Monica Kruger, Fuji Tech America, and Vince Lovato, Kings 3 Elevator Communication. While we may cover legal issues, this is not legal advice. Further, due, due to the rapidly changing nature of the law in COVID-19 crisis, we recommend you consult with your legal counsel on any issues and before you implement or change any policies of your procedures. So let's move on to our webinar. We will be answering questions that were submitted by you on, during the online registration. And we had a large number of questions submitted. So if we don't get to yours, um, I do apologize, but maybe I can do it on, maybe on our vlog that, now that we have that going. All right, so let's go to our first question. Hello guys. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Hi. All right. So the first question is, do you see destination dispatch becoming the norm moving forward when an owner decides to modernize? Sure, I can take that one. Um, the, the new normal is, is, as we know it, has changed. Um, I think destination dispatch will be more popular, absolutely. Um, while there are no buttons inside of the cab, there is still the touchscreen kiosk outside of the cab that you'll need to clean more frequently if we do a saw destination dispatch. Um, we do also see that is a better uh, application for larger buildings with heavy upkeeps and um, not, maybe not as good for smaller buildings for the destination dispatch. I can also add to that is it depends on the, the type of environment. If you have a lot of new users coming in that are have to relearn the process over and over, it's maybe not as, as ideal of a situation for that, but for, <clears throat> excuse me, for office buildings, particularly single tenant or multi-tenant office buildings where there's not a lot of public access, it becomes a lot more of an ideal usage for it. Okay. All right, we'll go on to the next one. How does the non-touch concept work for fixtures or buttons for for destination? There is a cover that can be placed over the destination control panel or we call it the, the DOP, Destination Operating Panel. So there's a cover that can be placed over it. It's a nanoseptic um, cover that is a self-cleaning cover. So it's antimicrobial and it can help with um, eliminating any germs or bacteria. Uh, it does have to be replaced every so often though. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Okay, so um, what materials future design concepts would be worth considering for such stringent cleaning needs and are they affordable? Good question. I'll take that since I do interiors of elevators. Um, there are many materials that you can use that will be non-porous 
So you can use any cleaning materials that you need on it or chemical based. And some of those are anything from all of your metals, your glass, a solid surface products, your quartz products, even your plastic laminates or any compact laminate surfaces, those are non-porous, even down to your tiles, like you know ceramic tiles and the whatnots. But what you have to consider is your porous materials will absorb all of that. And some of those, they ask for affordability. Some of those are very affordable, especially your metals that are most common, your stainlesses, bronze, et cetera. And then also your laminates, but your solid surface, your quartz, your glass, your self-safety laminated glass, that sort of raises the bar a little bit in your budget numbers. Okay. And you talked about metals. Are there, is there any metal that's anti-micro, antimicrobial? I know what you mean there. There is one, and that is copper. And the reason copper is, is because its ions interact with oxygen, which changes of the genetics of your you know, viruses, and they will kill them. It doesn't happen immediately. It could take really up to two hours or a little bit less. So it is pretty rapid. But with copper, as a finished person in an elevator, it needs to be lacquered just like your bronze does, or else it'll start tarnishing and getting your little pit grooves, et cetera. So that lacquer now has covered or concealed all of those chemicals that will fight the virus. So it almost undoes everything you need to do with copper. So if you're interested in copper, you need to just accept that it's gonna tarnish and move on and get that patina look will be great, or you need to blend it in with your other services. So that's the only metal that will provide that protection. And most people will lacquer it, so it just covered up your protection. So that's a choice at that point. Yeah, I, I think I've heard that you have to be careful when you're uh, to not have the disinfectant on the lacquer because that tends to take it off, is that? Is that what you've heard too, Carol? It is, it's true. So if you lacquer something, it's just really a coating, again, to protect the properties of that metal. And uh, lacquering stainless is an option just for looks and fingerprints. Lacquering bronze, brass, copper, that's actually to protect the properties so they don't tarnish. But as soon as you protect those properties, you have now covered and camouflaged all of those properties that will fight those viruses which that kind of went into my next question. I just sort of, um, I said it in a different way, but do you need to protect the finishes of non-porous materials if chemical antiviral cleaning is needed? You don't need to protect them. The problem is you're not releasing any protection for yourself. So um, like wood, wood is very porous in some aspects and you may put a sealant on it but the sealant is just actually to whatever's going to absorb be a slower pace. So like your stones, people usually seal stone. It's not because it's showing up to be porous like, you know, pumice or anything, but you're sealing it so it doesn't absorb, it's a, it's a rock, right? So it doesn't absorb its elements quickly and it gives you a chance to protect it. So you don't have to seal anything. Porous materials aren't going to damage, but it's not going to protect you that way for reasons of our, our COVID discussion here. Okay. How often should the elevator be cleaned and sanitized? It's an opinion at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do any cleaning. I'm not in the janitorial service and they have that down to a science, I'm sure at this point. So it's really gonna be a matter of the capacity level that's you know using that elevator. And I know everyone's trying to re replenish that down to four depending on the size of it. So you're gonna have a, a lot more usage going on. That, that's just a question of how the manager wants to address that. It's all about usage at that point. I'd agree, there's no standard on it yet. So it's really up to the manager and the janitorial staff to clean it as frequently as they have the capability to. Mm -hmm. Janet, did you have it's it I second third it third the same thing. It's really up to up to the manager manager staff and management staff and um, the janitorial staff. It depends on like Carol said. It depends on the usage. If your elevator is only being used a few times a day, it's probably less. If you're in a if you're in a public use, it's obviously a lot more need for that. Okay. The the next question I have um you kind of we touched on it a little bit. It's the question is, is it true there is a self-cleaning device for elevator buttons on the market? 
I've heard, I've heard that somewhere and was interested to know more. Yeah, I can touch on that a little bit. Just like the cover that goes over the DOPs for destination controls, there is an antimicrobial button cover that can be installed on buttons, on elevator buttons. So you can um, you can put it on buttons as well as the the companies that are manufacturing this also manufacture a wrap that can, that can go around the elevator handrail as well. Um, the recommendation with that though is that it, according to all the companies that are selling this now, is you do replace those every 90 days. Very good. Um, is there a hands-free system to add to current system? Um, I can touch on that one. There is, there are a couple of options that I've seen um, regarding hands-free. Uh, this really cool technology is coming out of China where it's a holographic button. Um, it's not, not being manufactured for the United States yet, it's still in testing uh, stages over in China, but hopefully uh, we'll see it in the next few years over here. It's kind of Jetson-y like to me, honestly. It's a, it sticks off of the buttons, uh, the COP, and it shows a holograph and it will sense your fingers on which button you're pushing and it'll select the floor for you. Um, I think we're a little bit away from that, but when we get it, that'll be awesome. But there are also fixtures out of Canada. Uh, Mad Fixtures makes them and they go on the bottom of the COP or the bottom of the wall and you can use your uh, foot to press the button. So those are called toe-to-go buttons. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of interest in that. And then the other option you also have is the remote call. Um, depending on your elevator, and it would, it would depend on the elevator um, controller that you have, you may be able to upgrade to a remote call where it's a, an app on your phone, and either your phone or your Apple Watch, uh, that you can call the elevator from the phone. There's different types of applications, and it all kind of varies based on what type of elevator you have right now. Um, if you do have, and that's where it kind of leads back into the destination controls, if you have the destination controls, you also have a lot more options in going towards the remote call or mobile calling for your elevators. That's very cool. Toe to go. I like that. Yeah, they're like little <laughs> foot pedals. <laughs> That's neat. Um, again, this one we kind of touched on too. Are people putting plastic sheets over the call button? And did kind of mention that, Janet. Mm -hmm. So um, just going back to that, the plastic sheet and the nanoseptic buttons or nanoseptic um, sheet. Button covers. Button covers, thank you. So the next question is, um, it will be impossible to monitor how many occupants are getting on an elevator at a time. Do you guys have any useful suggestions? I could jump in on that. I think the key to that is the signage that you have, making a recommendation to either uh, ride with your party, the party that, you're, that you came with, or uh, to not to, uh, overpopulate the elevator. So I think the key to that is signage and communicating that to the folks in your property. Okay. There's, I, I'd second that. Yeah, the signage, I, the other option you have is some people are doing starters in el for elevators or kind of going back to the, the elevator operators that we used to have in the 1920s and so now we're back in the 2020s um, and putting elevator starters um, to either push the buttons. So there's only one person pushing the button uh, it kind of eliminates the touch, eliminates or reduces the touch points there, as well as monitoring the number of people in the elevator. I think definitely if you're able to make some type of markers or if you're able to buy them professionally inside the elevator, I've noticed that whenever I go to a grocery store or any other place that we go these days, there's generally markings on the floor. And most people I see that whenever they see that cue, they they are able to go to that queue. So if you're able to do something like that in your elevator, that would help mm -hmm. as well. The one thing, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Monica. Oh, thank you. There are, um, there is another product out there that you can install in the cab that monitors through a camera. Um, it can act as a standalone system or it can be attached to the load weighing device in the cab. So it can sense how many people are in the car through the camera or through the weight of the car. Um, you can set it to where the car won't run or the doors will stay open. Um, it just, there, there's a few different products out there. Not many have been installed. This is all kind of new. Mm -hmm. The one thing you do have to keep in mind though is um, 
social distancing in elevators is kind of an oxymoron a little bit. So um, by putting, limiting your number of passengers in your elevator, you're also affecting your people flow throughout the building. So you could also be creating almost uh, another issue as well with the number of people backing up in your lobbies. And then with the load weighing devices, you also have to be careful if you're doing something like that, you have to be careful not to disrupt any building codes. Um, you might be solving one problem with social distancing, but then you could be cr creating another issue with like a fire code, for instance, if, the fi if there were to be a need for EMTs to bring a stretcher in, firemen geared up, they could, go, they could go past that load weighing and then the elevator may not run when it needs to. Good point. Okay, um, what are the most common tenant questions received as it relates to mm -hmm. the elevators? Uh, I get, can you speed up the elevators? I get that a lot. Um, can we slow down or speed up the elevators? Can I slow down or speed up the doors? Um, those are the two most common questions I've been getting almost daily. Yep. That and how to limit the number of people in the elevators, which I think we've touched on that a little bit already. Um, I've seen some, you know, great creative ideas out there is can I make the elevator so only one, you know, this elevator only serves certain floors and this one serves other floors. But once again, you also get into a people flow um, potential issue within your building as well. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So what, what can you as the elevator vendor um, do to assist more in the transition back to work? So I can touch a little bit on that. It would be um, some of these some of these different options, um, microbial cover, button covers. Those are probably the quickest solution for you. Um, so helping with some of those, helping with signage, we can recommend places that you can get signage, or we can help provide that signage for you as well. The other um, the other options. There's some air purifiers coming out that that are starting to be released and installed in elevators. And then there's also for escalators, um, and I know some, some office buildings obviously have those as well, is there's handrail sterilizers that can be installed inside the escalator. So we can kind of walk through probably the best thing that we can do right now is to be um, your trusted advisor and help walk through what options are available based on your specific type of elevator. Because every elevator is gonna be a little bit different. I wish there was just a cookie cutter Here's what we can do for every elevator, and that's kind of the button covers. But even like the toe to go fixtures, they're a great option, but they're not, they don't work with certain types of fixtures. So, really consulting with your elevator professional to identify what will work for your specific configuration of elevators. Also, um, you definitely want to make sure that your elevator maintenance company is doing their maintenance. Uh, the last thing you want to do is get a building start filling back up and you have elevator problems. So you want to make sure you're getting your maintenance and, and your elevators are in great shape when the buildings do start to get to capacity again. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay. Um, so what would you say your top two tips for elevator safety? What, what would those be? I'll take that if that's right. Um, it's it's um, social distancing, and of course that's going to be difficult in the elevator. But the recommendations from the CDC is is wearing the face mask if you're going to be in an elevator. And of course, if you have to touch the buttons, your first opportunity is to wash your hands when you get out of the elevator. It seems like the greatest amount of risk right now is in touching the buttons and then touching your face. So if you have a face mask in the elevator and first opportunity that you get outside of the elevator to wash your hands, that's gonna be the, the two uh, things that you can do to control and keep yourself safe. I, I agree with Vince on that one. You definitely wanna wash your hands frequently, um, you know, keep social distancing. It's six feet, doesn't seem like a lot, but it is <laughs> noticed that uh, six feet has been hard, especially at the grocery store, let alone in an elevator. So, you know, just use your hand sanitizer, wash your hands, be safe. It can be as simple as putting a hand sanitizer in every elevator bank, so they don't have to go and find one. They get off the elevator, there's your hand sanitizer, and then go about their business. They get on the elevator, there's their hand sanitizer versus, you know, carrying one at different locations in buildings, which are needed, or even in office space, but make it user-friendly. Off the elevator, hand sanitizer. On the elevator, 
hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. okay. Very good. Um, and the last question I have is, what is one good thing either personally or professionally that has come out of quarantine? I think personally for me is to learn patience. We're always in such a hurry and now we have to stop weight, six feet distancing, social distancing. So to learn the patience and also respect other people's, what they view is dangerous. And you know, they, some people take it seriously, some people don't. So just respect their vision of what COVID has done in their lives and the patience that it's gonna take as we make these changes. And I think the other thing is just thinking for me is thinking about new ways of working. I mean, here we all are with all of our backgrounds and most of us are obviously working from home. There's new ways of new ways of going out doing business, whether it's retail, retail to go or restaurants, curbside pickup. Um, I mean, there's there's just been so many new ways of how we're how we're operating as a society. And I think that's really been a great, a great asset. Yeah. I think I've really grown to appreciate my team a lot more working remotely and you know I'm used to seeing them every day working working together every day and now we're working separately and I just I'm excited to get back and, and see my team again and work together uh, six feet apart <laughs> you know I, I think that uh, in previous to this you know meeting with somebody in person and shaking their hand and making that personal connection is something that we all took for granted and it's gonna take us some time to get back to that point, but to be able to meet with people again in person and make, make that personal connection uh, is something that I think I'm not gonna take for granted in the future. Yeah, very true. Yep, definitely. Well, um, I, that was the last question and I don't see any in our Q&A box. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. And for everyone that submitted questions, I also want to thank our panelists for their time and expertise um, on this. And many thanks to our Boma Greater Keystone partners for their support, America's Corporate Building Maintenance, Blackman Mooring and BMS Cat, Breton Building Maintenance, CertiPro Painters of North Tex Far North Texas, Citywide Building Services, Flynn Companies, Property Paving, Reef Parking, Texas Roof Management, and United Mechanical. Finally, we know there is so much information that you need, so we will hold weekly web webinars on topics related to COVID-19. Our next webinar is on Thursday, May 21st, and will cover budget reforecasting. Information for this webinar can be found on our BOMA Greater Dallas website under the event calendar. So, Thank you guys and have a great weekend. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. Good one. Bye-bye.